Some people say that I want to believe in the Quran, but I don't know about hadith. I'm not so sure about hadith. Because Allah protected the Quran, but I'm not so sure about hadith being protected. I'm not so sure if it's accurate. And even if it was, so there's different kinds of criticisms, you need to understand those criticisms. First kind of criticism is people say, well, I'm not so sure if hadith was protected the way the Qur'an was protected. So even if we're reading a hadith, maybe it's not exactly what the Prophet said. Maybe there's some doubt in it. That's one problem. The second problem is, even if there isn't any doubt in it, after all, it's only the words of the Prophet, not the words of Allah. The words of Allah are what? Qur'an. So what should really matter is the words of Allah. The Prophet is just a human being. His words shouldn't matter so much. His, his opinions are his opinions. He's awesome. But we don't have, we're not obligated to follow the Prophet's words. We're obligated to follow Allah's words. Why would we put the words of a human being and put them in the same status as the words of Allah? And as a matter of fact, the Prophet is called a messenger, right? A messenger. What does messenger mean? Someone who delivers a message. And what is actually the message? The Quran. So people argue, well, even if the hadith is protected, well, it's just, that's the actual, the, the actual message isn't hadith, the actual message is the Qur'an. I agree with them. I say, you're right, the message is the Qur'an. So whatever the Qur'an says, we should take seriously. But what if the Qur'an tells us to take hadith seriously? Now what? <laughs> you understand? The best defense of hadith is actually not in hadith. The best defense of hadith, the sayings and doings of the Prophet ﷺ, is actually the Qur'an. So somebody who says, I take the Qur'an seriously, and I don't take hadith seriously, does not know the Qur'an. Clearly they haven't taken the Qur'an seriously. They haven't taken the Qur'an seriously. I'll start off with the easy one. Allah says in the Qur'an, إِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ no doubt about it, you are committed to a great character. The Prophet has a great character. He's a great human being. He has amazing manners. What is saying the Prophet has amazing manners? The Qur'an is saying that the Prophet has amazing manners. So if you want to learn amazing manners according to the Qur'an, you learn them from where? The Prophet wasallam. So believing in the Qur'an makes, compels me to learn the manners of the Prophet wasallam. Good enough? That's just about his manners though. That's not about his decisions or what he considered halal or haram or... It's just about his manners. So somebody could argue, well that ayah took care of his manners. But what about when he told us that some things you shouldn't do or some things you should do or... You know, what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable. That's not even in the Quran, it's in the hadith. What about that? That doesn't cover... That's not part of manners, that's beyond manners. Okay, let's look at this ayah. Allah Azza wa says, Fala. وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Please listen carefully. No, no, no. I swear to your master, they do not believe at all. In this ayah, who does Allah swear by? I swear to your master, they do not believe at all. Who is he swearing by? Mm. Sometimes Allah swears by the moon. Sometimes He swears by the sun. Sometimes He swears by time. Sometimes by the sky. وَالسَّمَاءِ وَالطَّارِقِ Sometimes by a fig or an olive or sometimes he'll swear by battle horses or winds or angels or angels of death. He'll swear by all kinds of things in the Qur'an. But all of those things are creations. Now Allah is swearing and He's swearing by what? Isn't this a different level? It's a different level when Allah decides not to swear by the moon or the sun or the skies and the earth. Decides to swear by Himself. So what he's about to say must be so important and so epic that its importance above all other oaths is the importance of Allah over all other creation. Instead of swearing by any creation, he swore by himself. And the first thing he says, I swear by myself. I swear by your master. They don't believe. Now did he say who they are? He just said they don't believe. Doesn't that leave you in a little bit of a complexity? Who are these people? That Allah did not just tell me they don't believe. He said, I swear by myself, they don't believe. These people have no faith whatsoever. Who are these miserable, unfortunate people that Allah Himself is describing 
as not having any faith whatsoever. He says, Hatta yuhakimu kafima shajara baynahum. They have no faith at all until they make you the Prophet, until they make you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the decision maker in anything that comes up among them. Any matter that comes up, if they don't think of you as the decision maker, then I swear by myself, they don't believe. Now the ayah does not say, I swear by myself, they don't believe until they make the Qur'an the decision maker. It's not what it says. The ayah says, I swear they don't believe until they make you the decision maker. The decision maker in what? In whatever sprouts, in whatever comes up among them. In whatever comes up among them. And then some people say the Prophet ﷺ can only give us advice about things that used to happen in the past, but his advice is not valid for modern times because things are new. That's why the ayah says, فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Whatever sprouts among them. Because sprouting means new things will what? Come up. New things will come up and he'll still be the decision maker. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the word of Allah, man. He takes care of every angle. Then he says, that's not enough. Even if they made you the decision maker, that's still not, I still swear they don't believe. What do they have to do? A step two. ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتِ Then after they make you the decision maker, they do not find any discomfort with whatever decision you made. Not with whatever decision Allah revealed, not with whatever decision the Qur'an made, not whatever decision Allah taught you, the literal words of the Qur'an are, with whatever decision you made, you as a person made, your decision they need to be happy with. If they find even a little bit of discomfort with the decision you made, I swear to God, I swear to myself, Allah is saying, they don't believe. The ayah says, when your messenger makes a decision, and you even feel uncomfortable, then I swear you don't believe. I swear you don't believe. When your messenger gives you a decision, you take it. That's not out of strictness of the rules. It is out of love and regard for the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The way we deal with our messenger ain't like anybody else. There is nobody who thinks of their messenger like we do. And by the way, the ayah is not done. Step one was they have to make you the decision maker. Step two was they can't even be ever uncomfortable with whatever you decided, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Step three, wa yusallimu tasliman, and then they give themselves in complete submission to that decision. They are totally cool with it, and they completely comply. They have full compliance. Yes, sir, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, sir, it's done. And our Prophet ﷺ predicted this ironically. Hadith is in Sunan Abi Dawood. So this hadith predicts it. Ibad ibn Sadiya said, the Prophet ﷺ said, You shik, it's only a matter of time. Very soon there will come a person. He is lying back on his couch, his, his feet up, meaning he's very lazy, very, very casual. And he says, Leave this Quran, leave this hadith, excuse me. Only tell me what the Quran says. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ala inna ma harrama Rasulullahi kama harlam Allah. Well, uh, Ala means indeed verily, anything Rasulullah makes haram, it is as if Allah has made it haram. Whatever I have made haram, it is coming from Allah, it is as if Allah has made it haram. So the hadith predicted a time will come when a person will say, and the way he has been described is casual, lackadaisical, arrogant, I don't care, lying back, muttaki'un ala arikati. He's lying with his back on the, on the cushion, not caring about anything and saying, don't give me hadith, only quote me Quran. The Prophet said it's only a matter of time, and wallahi, we see it with our own eyes. How many people, I'm sure every one of you has met these people, don't quote me hadith, only quote me Quran. There is no Islam without the sunnah of the Prophet of Islam. And this idea, this notion, it goes back, as I said, to the earliest of times, and it was refuted. Unfortunately, now it's become become somewhat, somewhat common. The, f the famous companion, Imran ibn al Hussein was sitting in his halaqa in the masjid, narrating hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When a man came and he shouted out and he said, Oh Imran, stop these narrations. I want to hear only the Quran. This is a sahabi. This is a sahabi, Imran ibn Hussein. He's giving hadith in the masjid of Kufa. And somebody comes and goes, stop these hadith. 
Don't tell me what you heard. This is directly, I heard the Prophet say. The man said, I don't want to hear it. Quote me only the Quran. Imran became visibly angry. His face became red. And he said, Ya Ahmaq, O oh fool, O oh fool. Did you find in the Quran that salah is five times a day? Did you find in the Quran that dhuhr is four raka'ah and you have to rec recite silently? That isha is four and you recite two out loud? Did you find in the Quran that zakah is 2.5% of your wealth? And he went on listing the basic religion of Islam that is found in the sunnah, not in the Quran, until the man realized his mistake. What type of Islam is there when you're not going to pray five times a day? By the way, five times is not directly in the Quran, it's in the Sunnah. What type of Islam is there when you're not going to stand and ruku and sujood and fatiha and do the arkan of the salah? It's not mentioned in the Quran. Why? Because the Quran tells you to follow the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Bukhari, pray as you have seen me pray. Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ said, Khudu anni manasikakum. Take your rights of Hajj for me. The Quran never tells you how to do the Hajj. It just says, Go for Hajj. Allah has legislated Hajj. It doesn't tell you how to do Hajj. And so on and so forth for all of the traditions of Islam. There is no Islam without the Sunnah of the Prophet of Islam. So anytime you hear somebody rejecting the Sunnah, making fun of the Sunnah, doubting the preservation of the Sunnah, because there's another tactic. You see, there's two tactics there's a direct tactic. The direct tactic is to say, I don't believe in hadith. And this unfortunately is common, but it is not that common. The more common heresy is to say, I don't believe in the preservation of hadith. Who is this man Bukhari that came 200 years after the Prophet Who is this man Muslim and Abu Dawud and Tirmidhi, they came 200 years. I don't trust their collections. Now, the topic of the preservation of hadith is a very, very uh, detailed one. And obviously, it's also academic one. There are, again, ways to talk about this in more detail. Khutbah does not allow me to do that. Suffice to state, you will always find the critics of the preservation of hadith are the most ignorant of the sciences of hadith. They've never actually studied them. And you should all know this is my area, one of my areas that I've studied. My bachelor's degree from the College of Medina, uh, from the University of Medina, was in the College of Hadith. My BA was in the College of Hadith. I spent four years specializing in the sciences of Hadith. That was my area of expertise. Then I diverted to theology. But my undergraduate in the Med University of Medina was in the sciences of Hadith. And I can guarantee you and assure you that no one who has studied the intricacy of those sciences can end up doubting hadith. You only find the one who is self-taught, reads a book or two, and then begins criticizing Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. You will never find a trained specialist who understands the intricacies. Then he criticizes all of hadith. True, one hadith might be something. But to say hadith has not been preserved. Anyone who says this, no, this is not mainstream Islam. And the net result of saying hadith has not been preserved is the same as saying the process should not be followed. So here's a simple logical point. Rather than going down the whole sciences of hadith, a simple logical point. When Allah has said in a hundred verses, obey the Prophet, then He must have preserved for us how to obey Him. Simple as that. When Allah has said, you must obey the Prophet wasallam, then how can we obey the Prophet in our times? We haven't seen Him. So then Allah must have, must have made sure and preserved the mechanism for obeying the Prophet is still amongst us. And that mechanism is the books of hadith.